to Greece. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Michaela Schmidt, a program coordinator at the Pulitzer Center. As we wait for more folks to join us, please feel free to let us know in the chat where you're listening in from. If you haven't joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world, then work with classrooms and with our mission to elevate public engagement with these issues. While we're based in Washington, DC, our staff and our work are global. A few logistics before we begin our conversation, you'll see a Q&A icon on your screen. You can begin adding your questions for our speakers at any time throughout our discussion. There is also a chat icon on your screen. We appreciate it if you'd use the chat box for any specific tech issues. We also want to note that we are recording this session and we will post it online. Also, if you're able to, stay a bit longer after the session ends to participate in a brief survey. Joining us for our conversation today are grantees Valerie Plesch and Enrique Huayquil, who collaborated on the Pulitzer supported project after the fall, Afghan Refugees in America. One year after the Taliban takeover, they explored how Afghan evacuees have been resettling across the US and the challenges that they face. Valerie is a freelance Vietnamese Argentine American photojournalist, documentary photographer, and writer currently based in Northern Virginia. Since early 2021, she has documented the growing Afghan community in the Washington DC region, including the resettlement of Afghan refugees and asylum seekers before and after the Taliban takeover. From 2014 to 2019, she was based in Kosovo where she focused on the aftermath of the war, including the legacy of sexual violence and covered breaking news, human rights issues, religion, sports, politics, and culture. In 2014, she reported from Afghanistan during the historic presidential election and produced other feature stories. Before pursuing her passion for visual storytelling, Valerie held a decade-long career in the international development field. Enrique is a Chile Chilean-American Emmy Award-winning cinematographer and editor at AJ+, where he has covered a wide variety of issues, including the Central American caravans trying to cross the US-Mexico border, the aftermath of the earthquake in Puerto Rico, white supremacy in America, COVID-19 intensive care units, and immigration detention centers. In his video journalism career, he has worked with the healthcare community, government and educational institutions, and the criminal justice community. Enrique is a descendant of the Mapuche indigenous tribes in Chile and is also a photographer. In Valerie and Enrique's piece published in the San Diego Union Tribune, they share the story of Omar Khan, who reflects on what he left behind in Afghanistan and what he hopes for his future in America. Omar is also joining us for our conversation today. He grew up in Cabal and studied and graduated from the journalism faculty. His deep passion and love for photography took him to different corners of his country, from the big cities to small villages. He believes that photography is his passion because it communicates across languages and cultures. He loves the process of making photographs and two years before evacuating from Afghanistan, he published a photo book titled Hidden Treasure. He was able to bring one copy on his flight out of Afghanistan so he could remember his country. On August 24th, 2021, Omar grabbed his camera and a few other belongings as he escaped his homeland with his wife, young son and brother, nine days after the Taliban entered the gates of Cabal and took control of the capital. He is among more than 80,000 Afghan refugees who were able to evacuate. He navigated chaos and danger at the airport before making his way onto a crammed US military flight with the United States as the final destination. A year later, he's created a new life for him and his family in San Diego County. We are going to share Valerie and Enrique's video about Omar's experience and then we'll begin our conversation. Grace, it doesn't seem like we have any audio. Oh. 
apologies for the technical difficulties here. Sorry about that, just a second. Paul, Grace is taking a look at that. Um, Valerie, do you just want to share a little bit about how you met Omer in the first place? Oh, sure. Or or should we wait? Or is it starting? Well, let, let's see if this works. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let me know if this works. Perfect. Thanks. Did the Taliban take over Afghanistan? I see by myself, by my own eyes, the Taliban take over Kabul. Everywhere I saw that uh, Taliban patrolling in their cars and motorcycles. I feel very, very sad and something broken in my heart. My name is Omar Khan. I am 28 years old. I am from Afghanistan and I work as a freelance photographer. I started photography since 2000, end of 2014, when I joined Faculty of Journalism. I escaped from Kabul, Afghanistan on August 24. I grabbed my camera. One. book and some documents that I had like passports and the uh, Afghanistan uh, controlled by Taliban it's I feel like it's have memories from the days that uh, Kabul was take over by Taliban it was it was very hard for us If you shop on Amazon, you should use this tool. It's a browser extension that automatically compares. All right, I think. What can I do for you? What can I do? When I was in Afghanistan, my job was a photojournalist, so I was focusing on my career, also my family. Uh, especially my father, he always support me. He, he like arts. He always, especially the music. He had like a very good collection of music, and he, he play, play loud the music, and we enjoyed the, that. We missed all this moment. My dad, my one brother, and one sister. Sister left in Afghanistan. I worked in Afghanistan as a photojournalist. All right. Since we're having some buffering issues, um, we're gonna share the link in the chat, and we'd encourage you to go watch that. Um, it's a really wonderful piece, but we'll just jump into our conversation here. Um, so Valerie and Enrique, do you want to talk a little bit about how you met Omer? Yeah, sure. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, I have been working on um, stories related to Afghan refugees and asylum seekers um, since really early 2021, so before the Taliban takeover. And so within my networks of um, organizations helping Afghans and other Afghans that I know in the community here, 
I met Omar in Washington, D.C. at a refugee music festival that was taking an art and music festival that was taking place at the National Cathedral. And Omar was invited to um, present his photographs at the Kennedy Center and at the National Cathedral grounds as part of the festival. And um, of course, being another photographer, I wanted to meet him and um, I did. And I think we hit it off and I kept in touch <laughs> with him. And then when we got the grant, um, we were looking for other outlets to publish um, our a, a story, more stories because at first we just got the PBS NewsHour and but we knew we could um, publish in other outlets. So I had reached out to Omar who lives in San Diego to see if he would be interested in us doing a short video and story about him. He said yes, and then I pitched it to the San Diego Union Tribune and talked about Omer. So it was just great timing um, that I had met Omer over the summer, and then we got the grant. So yeah, amazing. And yeah. Enrique, why did you think that video was the way to tell this story? Um, because his his story, his um, personal story, is so rich. You know. Um, know that photography is, 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 is not a good resource to um, show a story, but, you know, when we can put somebody on camera and see their, uh, you know, their expression as to what they went through, you know, um, when you combine that with the B-roll and the audio, um, it just, it's just a different powerful way to show it. That's, that's why we, we thought that video would be the, the medium for this presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Omer, I'm curious to hear, why were you willing to have your story told? What was it about Valerie and Enrique as journalists that made you comfortable and made you realize that you needed to do this? Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. So, as uh, you know that everyone, the uh, lot of Afghan people came as a refugee uh, since Taliban take over Afghanistan, and lots of people like me, they have a, a good life in Afghanistan. They have like doctors, uh, journalists, and they uh, now they are uh, like a refugee living there, and nobody know their story and who are who are they. And that is why when uh, Valerie meet me, and after that she. Must um, text me that uh, you want to be part of this. Uh, we want to make your story. Uh, are you ready, or you want to to allow us to make a, make a, a story about your life? I was. I say yes. Why not? I have to share my story. I have to tell my uh, untold story to the people that uh, they didn't know about me. So that was. I feel comfortable, and uh, I have to share the story of my life with the people to know. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm curious to hear, Valerie and Enrique, when did you realize that there was a story to be told in the newly displaced diaspora? And why did you focus on the experience of refugees in America specifically, as opposed to elsewhere? Um, well, I knew that the one year anniversary was coming up and I honestly I couldn't even believe that one year had already come had passed since the Taliban took over Kabul and the country essentially collapsed on August 15th and um, I just, you know, we, there were so many stories when the evacuation process was happening in August for those two weeks, uh, the last two weeks of August. And a lot of stories, the news media was covering that. And the 76,000 Afghans that were coming to United States, sure, there were a lot of stories, but you know, other things that, you know, the news cycle, there are other things that <laughs> take over Ukraine, everything. But I, I just knew that with the one year anniversary coming up, this would be a really good time to highlight um, what refugees are still going through one year later. It's not just when they enter the United States, everything, um, you know, is happens easy for them to resettle. They are still going through a lot. And the separation from their family, um, that's still a huge issue. So these are the kind of things that I knew I wanted to explore um, through the grant and um, with 
with this story with Omer. So um, I just wanted to continue this, continue the dialogue, continue the storytelling surrounding Afghan refugees um, one year later. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and Enrique, was there anything that specifically drew you to this topic? Well, as Valerie said, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the main catch was that it was the one year anniversary um, and how unique uh, Omar's story was. Um, and, uh, you, you know, he also happens to be a photographer like us. Um, so uh, at least for me, you know, it's hard to imagine living um, my country um, you know, while being a professional photographer, which is something, you know, I know Omar loves to, you know, with his soul, just like we do um, in our photography. So that to me made it more um, like a more interesting, um, he, he, he became a more interesting sub subject versus, you know, other people that know that they're less important, but you know, the connection that was, that was for me, that was a connection, the, the creative part. The, the job, the photography. Yeah, absolutely. And Omer, how has photography helped you through this time and through this really tumultuous period? Uh, since uh, I start photography, uh, as I say, that it's like, a, a, it's a communicate across the culture, across the countries. And uh, that is why uh, since I was, uh, starting photography and I heard about Afghanistan. Uh, I followed everyone, all photographers around the world. Um, I was followed, uh, maybe Valerie know me that I follow her since, since she was in Afghanistan, but she didn't know me, but I was follow her and follow his, uh, her work in Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, was my, uh, like uh, sharing, um, following people and uh, uh, learning from them. And uh, also the, I share my photos from Afghanistan because uh, lots of uh, uh, foreigners that say Afghanistan is still war before Taliban, but uh, nobody have uh, like a, a good image from Afghanistan. All the stories was shared in the news. Everything was like a war and uh, explosion, but I decided uh, to share a positive side of Afghanistan to doing photography. And it helped me a lot. And I, it connected me with the lots of people that, uh, uh, and uh, it's still, uh, it's, it uh, helped me a lot when I came to US, lots of people that I, I ever ne uh, never meet them, but they are uh, followed me on my Instagram page and my Facebook page and they must will, will come to America and they ask me for help. The, and the photography job helped me a lot when I came here, more than like a, uh, like a uh, uh, resettlement agency, people who was here and they know me uh, as, a, as a photographer and they follow me, uh, my work. And they helped me a lot more than the resettlement agency in America. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, and I know as Valerie had said, there's no clear path for you all um, here in America. So how have the few months been for your family since this piece? Uh, uh, like uh, when we escaped from Afghanistan, so we, we thought, uh, life is easy in America, so we will go, we will start new life. And it was like, just imagine. But when I came to America, and I, I, almost we spent like more than three months at the refugee camp, the refugee camp uh, at the camp at the Indiana police, then we settled at the San Diego. And the day that uh, cause of maybe lots of refugees and one time came to San Diego in all counties, so when they, uh, we came to uh, America and I see the life is very hard and uh, uh, I pay uh, like uh, for all the process, uh, it, it was hard for us to, to, to know about what is, uh, how to travel from other, one side to other side of our works. 
So it, it was hard for me, especially for the uh, a little, uh, lots of people helped me and lots of people, still Afghan refugees that they didn't know English and they can't uh, speak very well English and they, uh, they can't uh, uh, communicate with the people and they are still suffering with the loss of problems. So I'm happy and, uh, but the life here is, I start life from zero, from, uh, from nothing. Still, I'm happy at the, uh, it's good. Good, that's good to hear. Um, Valerie and Enrique, I'm curious to hear what were some of the challenges that you faced when telling these stories about this newly displaced diaspora? Hmm. Um, well, for me, I know it's still getting interest from editors to be still engaged with what's happening to Afghan refugees. Um, you know, even I, before I got the grant, you know, I would, I do pitch and some, like, well, some news outlets like, well, you know, there's so much else going on and, you know, that's kind of the, the nature of the game um, and the news cycle. Um, so it was getting well, for this um, to get interest from other outlets besides you know, news hours. So I'm really thankful, so thankful um, to San Diego Union Tribune. I had cold pitched to, I had sent an email to the director of photography, Samuel Hodge, Hodges, and, um, and he was on board. So I think that made it, um, you know, was great um, that they had never worked with the Pulitzer Center. And um, it was great for them to know that a, an Afghan refugee photographer has moved to their city. So um, that that was um, really great. But um, I don't know, Enrique, do you wanna talk about any of the challenges you faced while, while we were there filming? Sure, sounds good. Um, for me, the biggest challenge, I guess, was to, um, was how to film Omar um in a way that you know um what we how we see him visually in the video is comparable to the video the beautiful work that he makes um because you know we could have just done like a zoom call or something um but we decided to go there and actively participate in his daily life met his family uh, so that to me was was uh, I would say that was the most most challenging part. How to show him like on camera, you know, what angles to do, you know, have him do what, you know. We went to his work, you know, follow him, follow him for a day, um, driving shots, you know, coming up with all those ideas on the spot. Um, that to me was was the challenge. Of course, the editing part too, but you know. We did that as a team um, between Valerie and I. You know, we sat together for for hours, uh, review everything on the flight back. You know, uh, in, in the plane, um, reviewing audios to to be selecting pieces because we had so many, so much good material that this could have been like a thirty minute video easily. You know, so that was the other part that was challenging, like how to compress everything in 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 a piece that is like this short you know mm -hmm. um uh, but i think i think it looks great and i think it it, it conveys his story and it it highlights how um important this subject is like valerie was saying before you know um people think that the people from afghanistan that escape you know are here and they're doing great and you know they're better than how they were before and that's not always the case you know um, even if you have, I guess, you know, safety reasons is, is sure this country is, is better, you know, but also as a, as an immigrant, you know, I have to say that, you know, it, it, it related to me a lot, um, to show the B side of the story. I do want to add in terms of the timing, that was a big challenge because we, um, the San Diego Union Tribune was going to release the video and the print story of Omar's story, because we also did a text and photo essay um, uh, on that Saturday after we were there. So we literally had Sunday and Monday with Omar 
and then had Monday night until Friday to to put everything together and do a lot like live edits with the um, San Diego Union Tribune video team and me I was working with the writer the their editors and writers so packaging all of this in less than a week was definitely a challenge but I'm sure yeah, yeah and I'm so I'm interested to hear a little bit more about why you chose to focus on an individual story and tell that personal tale when there are 80,000 refugees um, and there are so many numbers and stats I'm sure you could share as well. So what made you choose this story format? Like a kind of like a profile on Omar? Yeah. Well, I always find that human interest stories such as this one about Omar tells the larger story of an issue or a crisis. Um, you know, Omar's story, I'm sure every single refugee here and refugees from other countries um, can, Omar's story resonates with them. And his story about fleeing, have his family still left behind, restarting all over again, getting a driver's license, getting a car, finding work, you know, taking care of his young son, his wife, <laughs> everyone is going through that. So the fact that we have this incredible access to into Omar's life to tell that, it tells the whole, I think the larger story of what Afghan refugees are going through right now. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, with especially how it's the access, um, we would not have been able to tell the story of Afghan refugees through Omar's um, through Omer without that access. So I really, um, I really value that. And um, I'm so thankful that he was, yeah, because we couldn't tell the story. We were not able to go to his workplace, in his car, in his home. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and Omer's is just one of many refugee stories. So I'm, interested through your communities, Omar, what are you hearing are some of the greatest challenges facing Afghan refugees in America, even if they're not challenges you specifically are facing? Yeah, since uh, the Afghan new refugees came, uh, uh, I always mention lots of uh, facing uh, contact with the new refugees, talking with them, the mostly that they are uh, suffering and they are challenging with their, uh, as I say that, like as like 70 or 50 percent of Afghan refugees that they came, they knew English. Like a 50 more percent, they they couldn't talk in English. They couldn't even they couldn't write. They are, uh, uh, so it was it was hard for them. Lots of Afghan refugees that they are living in our community. I I know him. I know them. They are still they didn't know how to write and uh, how to read, how to speak English. And they just like uh, blind people. They they didn't know what to do, and they are suffering from the uh, like uh, like in my community in my own uh, 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 apartment that I live. Not uh, some of the Afghan refugees new cameras are living, and uh, sometimes the uh, owner call me. Can you help me with this uh, person? When I go and ask them what happened, they they didn't pay the uh, the. A meter net, the the uh, the water uh, bill and the trash bill, they didn't know. They the the cause they have to check every day their uh, mail to the water the water bill. Everything come in the mail and they have to pay, and they didn't know how to pay that, and they uh, also how to uh, come to, like uh, they every month they have to before the date that they. Uh, 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 the house give the date for the rent, they have to pay, but sometimes they pay because of maybe they, because uh, of they don't find the money or the, their salary came late, so they came uh, and the owner said uh, they give me late, so we have to charge them the late fee. So they didn't know these are the problems that they're facing and the, uh, lots of them with the transportation. If, Especially if you do, we, uh, lots of them didn't know English, how to go to by trolley, by the bus, they can't uh, also take the uh, 
like a public transportation. They just, uh, they need uh, at first to, uh, some people, cause the culture, the, everything is 100% changed from Afghanistan. The, uh, how to behave with the people, how to talk with the people. Uh, it has got lots of people by the resettlement agencies uh, uh, connected with the uh, like uh, English classes. They join the English classes and the and the English classes. Beside the uh, English classes, they should teach about the culture, the the how to live in the America. Got lots of people they didn't know how to talk with the uh, shopkeeper, how to buy, how to uh, help people. So it is necessary for that some people, uh, Afghan refugees for all, not for some, for all. It is like lots of, lots of things are new for me too, for other people also. They have to share the, tell about the culture, the everything, the, uh, the, the, like uh, the, all uh, the holidays, which days, why they celebrate this, the, these days. So they have to know which, what is, uh, which is uh, like a, they can join or like a Christmas, these kind of things, they have to know about everything. So lots of things uh, like people, uh, ref refugees suffering. And especially lots of, some of them I know that they still didn't have work and they are like suffering for their paying the rent. Mm -hmm. These are the things that lots of refugees nowadays suffering in, uh, in my community. Yeah, and Valerie, through your reporting, are you seeing a lot of similar issues and how are you seeing people help and make a change in this? Um, so many issues. I mean, you know, it's um, the biggest one I think right now is the legal pathway for all these evacuees to remain in the United States. So everyone that came here from Afghanistan are parolees, humanitarian parolees, but they have um, a two year um, time limit to, to stay here and they have to find another way to legally stay here. So that's why so many are seeking asylum. And um, we've already passed the one year mark. So essentially these 76,000 people have about a year or less than a year now to remain here. And there is a new bill that's going to be, that's already been introduced to Congress, but it hasn't been um, passed yet called the Afghan Adjustment Act that would create that legal pathway for Afghans to stay here. So that's really critical that um, that that happens. So um, because everyone here is like kind of like an illegal limbo right now. So that is a major, major issue that I think everyone is feeling and facing. And um but other than that, it's, uh, you know, every, every, I feel from all the refugees that I have spoken to and interviewed and I know and have said, you know, they're getting different treatment from different agencies in terms of caseworkers being assigned to them, not following up with them on a consistent basis, not enough, they don't get their food stamps in time. And some of some families are large, you know, have five, six children and um, there's not enough food and uh, can't afford rent. And, you know, they're, they're not getting the same benefits as um, other refugees that come through um, uh, UNHCR and all of that who are resettled here and get um, all these benefits. So a lot of people have to kind of fend for themselves. So that's why a lot of these aid organizations, uh, religious organizations, and just individuals are kind of filling that void. Um, but what I've seen that's really remarkable is that um, I've seen Afghan refugees or Afghan Americans who were refugees, you know, 40 years ago because Afghans have been coming in waves um, over the last 40 years because of the various conflicts. So a lot of those former refugees are now helping today's Afghan refugees. So that's been something really remarkable to see. Um, but yes, there's a myriad of issues, lingering issues that um, Afghans are facing. Um, so yeah, it's not over for them. And trying to get their family over here. Um, that's another issue. 
Of course. And since Russia's takeover of Ukraine, have you seen that affect the way that refugees in America are perceived and specifically the assistance Afghan refugees are receiving? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of comparisons between the two. Why are Ukrainian refugees being treated differently than Afghans? Why is the process quicker for them than Afghans? I don't have those. I'm not going to present my answers for that or opinions, but um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, good that that's being discussed. Um, it is it, it is a, uh, definitely a, re a relevant concern. And um, but uh, there's still we can't forget that there are tens of thousands of Afghan allies still trapped in Afghanistan who have not found a way to come here and their status um, of many of them qualify for the special immigrant visa for working with the U.S. government, um, including my own former colleagues that uh, I worked with when I used to work on a U.S. government funded project who are still stuck there and can, were not able to get on those planes um, between August 15th and the end of August. And, um, you know, that that is really heartbreaking that they just don't know when they can leave. And then for the Afghans that did make it out here, who, who did apply for humanitarian parole status for their family members back in Afghanistan to come here, it's been 14 months and there's been no movement on their um, on their status. I was just researching this that um, 40,000 45,000 Afghans have applied for humanitarian parole and less than 500 have been approved. Um, and that's as of the summertime. So maybe the number went up a little bit, but I don't think it did. And of course they have to pay $575 for each application. So that is a lot of money that's being spent um, and there's been no real movement. So this is another, I think an issue that all the refugees are facing right now is trying to get their member family here and what happened and, and not knowing when that will happen. Absolutely. And Omar, do you still have family and friends in Afghanistan? Yeah, I have still my father, uh, my brother, my brother who work with the, also work at the, uh, with the U.S. Embassy. Uh, still, he was, uh, he is uh, still uh, in Afghanistan. He contact a lot and uh, still, waiting for my cousins that they were working with the Americans at the, uh, at the airport. They're still in Afghanistan. They couldn't uh, find the way on the August to come out uh, from Afghanistan. So uh, my father, so everyone, uh, like I know that they are work. Like my family, all work with the US uh, government. All my family, my brothers, just one, one of my brother that he, he didn't work with the uh, Americans. The rest, all, all of my brothers worked with the Americans. So luckily me and my other brother, we came out and, but the, my smaller brother who he worked, he was work at the US embassy, but he couldn't also get out from uh, Afghanistan on that day. So this is the, like my cousins still, he, he always asking about his, cause uh, one time his, uh, he was, uh, all the, his document was approved, but still he is waiting. And are you able to be in contact with them or is contact pretty limited? Uh, with my family, uh, I'm always uh, like in a week, one time, two time I'm contact them, asking them about their health, about the situation, because always we were worried about the uh, cause, cause of Taliban. So they, uh, they do then they don't do anything so that is why we always talking with them asking about the especially with the, my brother that he had a contact with the uh, their supervisor and the other stuff that uh, he was work he contact to ask them about the uh, his work process and my cousins so was, uh, we are contact him but nobody get any answer from for now for for the uh, for the visa or any uh, movement to come to America. Mm -hmm. That's really difficult. Yes. Um, yeah, on a, on a different note, um, Omar, I'm curious, what are you hoping to photograph next? Um, are you hoping to establish a new photo book anytime soon? Uh, for now, so at, uh, I have a, uh, idea, 
since I published my uh, photo books in Afghanistan by the name of The Hidden Treasure on 2019. So after that, when I saw that my photo book was uh, uh, encouraged by lots of people uh, and lots of people uh, love it. And that is why I was uh, decide to uh, publish the second book of the second edition of the, my photo book from Afghanistan. So I already in Afghanistan, I was tra traveled uh, around uh, more than six more provinces of Afghanistan to take uh, pictures for my new second edition book. So after that, so the COVID came after COVID, the Taliban the, uh, fall, fall back to Afghanistan by Taliban. So I uh, I stopped the work. I, I have still my uh, my photos from Afghanistan. I have idea in my mind to for maybe next years uh, to publish a photo book of from Afghanistan that I had the second edition of uh, the hidden treasure to uh, publish. So I'm still in a, in a San Diego and my weekend time I'm going out and taking pictures. Uh, so I I do my photography. That's good. It's good to hear. Thank you. And what was that process like of making a video about a photographer? Um, anyone is open to answer this, but I'm curious, were you able to collaborate on the creative process or did that just really assist in that? When we were open with, I mean, Omer was, um, you know, I was in daily multiple times <laughs> during the editing process, like to get information from him and, um, uh, I don't think he saw edits of the video, but um, while we were filming, I mean, he's, you know, we could show him glimpses and he knew like everything we were doing, <laughs> um, especially doing, yeah, and I was taking pictures of him and his family and everything. And I shared all of that with him. So he, you know, he knew what would, you know, eventually what's going, um, what we had chosen and everything and getting the right captions. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if Omar wants to talk about how it was having <laughs> photographers and videographers following him around, him being a photographer. I mean, I, I would say I was a little nervous, like, oh my gosh, Omar is amazing. His photography from Afghanistan is, everyone should go on his Instagram and look at his stuff. Um, you know, I, I was just hoping I would do justice by, you know, taking, capturing his life in America. Um, but he was so great, so gracious and so humble. And, um, but yeah, I, I think it was a great team effort for sure. Yeah. Omar, did you like us following you around? And uh, yeah, so <laughs> it was uh, uh, when the Valerie and Enric camped and uh, I, at first I was nervous uh, in front of camera because Everyone do, uh, like myself or Valerie, everyone do photography or especially also the Enric doing videography. Whenever you uh, came in front of camera to say something or do something, you become nervous. Oh, uh, what should I say? What should... So at first I was nervous. When uh, Valerie and Enric came and I was talking with them, I feel free. So when the, when I, so I, I know that they take a lot of shots from every part, every angle. So I know that they take the a good parts or and the editing, they make it shorter or they choose the, the best parts of that they, uh, they took. So I was feel comfortable and I was uh, uh, happy and uh, doing my, I call my uh, coworkers to let us to do a filming in the, inside my work area. So I was feel good and uh, it was nice to work with the uh, Enrique and uh, Valerie. It was so yeah. fun. And Enrique, you mentioned this a little bit, but as an immigrant yourself, how did that change this experience? How did that um, inform how you approached it? Um, well, uh, you know, I'm from Chile. Um, I was born and raised there, uh, but I've been in the U.S. for over 20 years and I'm also a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. um, I lived through my, in my childhood, I live in a dictatorship, um, you know, I went from, and, you know, and by the way, a dictator that was placed by the U.S. Um, from 1973 to, I think, 1990 or 1991. So my, 
all my childhood was, you know, surrounded by um, the idea that the military is out, you know, the, the every, everything is so strict and, you know, um, people are so close-minded um, as far as like uh, political affiliations, because, you know, Chile has everything, it has the Communist Party up to, you know, far right wing um, people too. Um, in that sense, you know, I felt connected. Um, it wasn't as violent, I guess, as Afga and Afghanistan, but in a sense, you know, that was that was a connection to me. Because um, I mean, I, I saw a lot of many like crazy things. I remember being a child, and you know, it wasn't easy to go out and play with the other kids because you know you never knew when a fight was going to break up, break out. Um, and then you'll have the, the army coming to your house in the middle of the night. So um, it's just a different sort of organized group, you know, um, as far as soldiers versus guerrilla people. Um, so that was that was my main connection for for the story. And in, in that sense, you know, obviously the visual part too, as we said before, the fact that Omar is, a, is an amazing photographer and just like Valerie is, you know, um, it was it was a, a, um, a very healthy competition in a way, you know, <laughs> to try to make everybody look great and, you know, look for nice angles and, and you know, create um, a powerful video out of this amazing resources that we got um, in, in a couple of days. And, you know, as I said, this could have been a good 30 minute video if not more, because of all the, 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 the amazing stuff that we got that, you know, it took a lot of effort for us to cut it down to the size that we, we, we see it right now. So, but I think it looks, it looks great. And, you know, uh, all of this, um, it, it was in a way, it was sort of like a, like a um, hidden relationship, you know, out of our photography and me being an immigrant. Etc. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's all three of your photography backgrounds definitely shined through in the piece. It is so visually stunning. Um, I would definitely encourage everyone who's joining us today to take the time to watch that here after this. I just want to add also that um, because my family are all refugees from Vietnam, they were uh, from the Vietnam when Saigon fell. So it this whole reporting process for me, it has been deeply personal. And even my own family members were commenting on Omer's story when it was on social media, like saying, wow, his experience is just like ours. And you know that was 40 plus years ago, 45 years ago now. Um, so it's just amazing that refugees from all these different wars and where America did fail um, in these two major uh, conflicts, you know, it's still very deeply felt um, after all these years. So um, for me, I never experienced war, but being a granddaughter of, grand, you know, refugee grandparents and my cousins and aunts who all came here, I think it really um, propelled me even further to really tell the story accurately of these Afghan refugees, of these refugees, because I think, I, I don't know, I kind of felt in a way feeling what my family went through. Absolutely, it's such a cyclical process. Um, well, as we're nearing the end of our time, I kind of wanna end with one last question. Um, how do you think that Americans can be thinking more deeply about the situation in Afghanistan and supporting Afghan refugees? Um, what are just those big takeaways from this piece? I think compassion, continuing to have that compassion towards um, the refugees that are still working really hard to start from scratch here. They do have a long road ahead. Um, if there are ways to volunteer, teach English, um, help with all of these volunteer organizations delivering uh, uh, you know, furniture open, you know, just if they can, they are in dire need. I mean, I get every day, dozens of emails from various aid organizations saying we have an Afghan family, you know, family of 12 that needs 
two beds and this and that. And, you know, still it continues all these months later. Um, they were first in refugee camp in United States in different military refugee camps and now trying to you know, really start again. So I think having that compassion um, towards them um, as they continue to resettle and as more refugees continued coming. And I don't think we should forget about what's happening in Afghanistan, but monitor the news. Um, you know, the Taliban said there would be different, but there's been no signs that they're doing anything that's different. There is no independent media left in Afghanistan. It's extremely difficult to do, to do that. Um, so if there's ways that we can still, you know, just be informed and not forget um, what is happening there. there. Of course, there are other crises happening around the world, for sure. We just, I feel with all of America's engagement for the last 20 years in Afghanistan, you know, yes, the country collapsed, but it doesn't mean our interest and engagement with the country um, should collapse either. Absolutely. Omer, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you. I don't have anything for it now. Wonderful. Um, Enrique, any last thoughts as well? Um, well, um, I'd like to thank the Pulitzer for helping us with this project. Um, it was, it was a, you know, obviously it was a great help for us, you know, um, in every possible way, technically. And, you know, they were always there to answer questions um, and to connect us with people, you know, with good people. Um, very fluid. Everything was super fluid. Um, so just wanted to say thank you to, you know, everybody, you know, especially, the, as I said, the Pulitzer and, of course, Omar and Valerie. It was a great collaboration and, you know, I think we made a good team and the story was, came out pretty good too. <laughs> it and absolutely San Diego, did. The San Diego Union Tribune for being interested in the story. I just can't thank them enough on their whole visuals team. And I know that they're, um, hopefully, you know, Omar might be able um, to collaborate with them as well. And um, yeah, and I do want to say that um, because Omar had a shop at the U.S. Embassy, he had a, a, a gallery there. And after the story was published, I was getting text uh, Instagram messages saying, oh, my gosh, I saw I met Omar at his shop in at the U.S. Embassy. I remember him. So I have one of his prints. I, I'm like, now it's just so nice to see him in the story uh, that a story published about him. Um, so it just really comes full circle. And that just shows also the character of Omar that people who came through the US embassy, because a lot of, you know, there were a lot of Americans working at the embassy in the last two decades, but that they remember Omar. So, and that just made me really happy. <laughs> That is wonderful to hear. And thank you, Omer, for being thank willing you. to thank share you. your story. Well, everyone. Yes. Um, well, I'm just going to wrap us up here, but thank you all so much for your time. Um, and we shared Omer's Instagram in the chat. So be sure to follow him um, and continue to see his incredible photography. Um, we appreciate all of you in our audience for joining us today. And for those of you who are able, please consider becoming a Pulsar Center champion to support our work. Finally, a survey will follow the end of this webinar. We would really appreciate you taking the time to complete it to help us improve our events. Thank you again for joining us today and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good one.